Hello viewers, welcome to your program. It is Economic Insight. It's glad to know you're watching your program. I am Paul Kingsley. Now, in continuation with the ongoing report we are doing on infrastructure development in Nigeria, today on the program we are in Eastrom Nigerian Limited. And with us on the program is the Managing Director, CEO, who is going to be giving us his own take on the various issues, challenges affecting infrastructure development in Nigeria. I'm talking of Ishaku Gambo Dori. He's going to be giving us, like I said, you know, their own contribution in no small way to the development of our infrastructure. Sit back with us. It's promised to be an interesting conversation. I'll be back after this time out. Thank you. Well, the, the company was incorporated in, uh, in 2014. We started operation at the tail end of 2015. We came in to service the medium and real estate market. So, um, so far, we've, we've uh, completed a few projects around Abuja, uh, delivered more than 20 units last year, and we have target of delivering close to 50 units of uh, houses this year. So. Uh, that's where we are right now. Well, we've always had uh, the passion for construction, building construction. I mean, the company has uh, mainly professionals, architects, real estate uh, professionals, builders. So we're a team of professionals. So everybody's passionate about building. So when we came together, everybody's aim was to deliver something that was uh, of very high quality luxurious and of course uh, affordable price. We have, uh, we have Eastrom residences in Life Camp, we have Eastrom residences in Jabi, we have them in Uia as well. Then we also have some new projects coming up in Use, Zone 5, and then of course in Meitama. So we, uh, we are all over the town. And then we also have plans of doing larger apartments uh, in Jahi. Uh, I think the best thing about our company is we try to give a complete package. When people buy real estate um, houses from us, uh, we like to believe that you get everything you expect from a proper home. So when we move into areas that don't have uh, basic infrastructure, we provide them. And then by the time we, bu we build the houses, the ho we make sure that everything is maintenance free, at least for the first few months. So at the same time, while you're living in your house, we take care of facility management and things like that. So, you're, so from end to end, we make sure that the, uh, the building is fully serviced. So, people are, so our clients are very happy with that. Well, uh, you know right now, the problem with uh, acquiring real estate in Nigeria is the uh, availability of access to, to mortgage facilities. I'm sure the government does a lot in providing mortgage facilities for people in government, but people in the private sector are still lagging behind. So you'll find out that uh, most of the people that are able to afford houses, I mean, real luxury houses, are people that have already accumulated a certain amount of wealth. So mo you find out that most likely they've been in business for 15, 20 years for them to, to be able to afford these houses. The issue is the, uh, the margin for profit. When you talk about um, low-cost houses, the, uh, the business model is such that you make profit on volume. And for a real estate developer in Nigeria, for you to build on volume, you need to find a large chunk of clients. So where can you get that in Nigeria? Only people in government will come as a bulk. So that becomes very difficult. That, when you start to do that, then you have to deal with government. And then you know, of, of course, dealing with government means a lot of processes as well. So because of the margin, profit margin, I think that's where most real estate developers try to stick within the medium end to high end. I don't think it's the responsibility of government to meet that demand. 
You see, what, the, what government needs to do is to provide the enabling environment, to focus on the economy, to ensure that people can afford houses. This, the process, you see, the system is simple. You educate someone, you train him, you employ him. When he starts to accumulate wealth, then the next thing would be what? To acquire a house. So if uh, Nigerians can begin to acquire houses earlier in their life uh, through one or two, one or two uh, options for financing, for mortgage financing, then there will be that issue of 17 million deficits will not be there. The reason why we have that 17 million deficits, as uh, claimed by uh, some statistics, is because the economy is not robust enough. So the government needs to focus on creating the, uh, the enabling environment allowing the average Nigeria to, to be paid to earn good salary, then when he earns good salary, he will be able to afford his house. Then the government doesn't, does not need to worry about building those houses. Once the, the people are there that want houses, the developers will come in. It's as simple as that. Yes, uh, I feel they are not doing quite enough. But maybe they are doing what they can at the moment. But of course, uh, they can do more. We would like to see more people in the private sector being able to access mortgage facilities. I think the Federal Mortgage Bank is, is, uh, is, is doing as well as it can. But of course, uh, more, should be, more should be done in terms of uh, creating, making it more accessible so that the average Nigerian should be able to, can be able to access uh, financing. I believe Nigeria doesn't lack any skill because if you go to other countries you still find Nigerians practicing all sorts in all sorts of industries. The reason why they may think that we don't have project management skills is because people tend to leave. But of course we have Nigerians everywhere that, that are excellent in project management. You can't, you can't just attribute project, manage, project failure to project management because when you say project management it's actually a it's actually a broad, uh, a broad sector. So project failure itself can be caused by so many different things. It could be poor planning, poor financial management. Of course, there are a lot of uh, sharp practices going on, which the government is doing as much as it can to stop. Then, of course, there are poor materials going all over the place. Um, SON and uh, the customs units, they are, they are also doing their best to, come to curb that as well. But there are so many reasons why a project can fail. You can't just attribute it to project management. Yes, I think Nigerian companies are doing very, very well. But um, we don't really have as many large construction companies that can take up some projects. So, and then the issue of finance as well. The reason why Nigerian government tends to give out some construction projects to foreign companies is because of they are able to finance them and then so it makes it easier but i don't feel that nigerian companies are not being treat, treated well because quite a lot of nigerian companies do a bulk of the projects in nigeria i'd like to tell anyone who's willing to acquire real estates not just in nigeria but every, everywhere around the world to try to engage the the, uh, the property developer to get to know the quality standard that they operate on, the, uh, the technical team, and then they should focus on the design as well. The most important thing you need to remember is when you acquire a property, you most likely acquire it for life. So when you come to Istrom Nigeria Limited, we pride ourselves in good quality, excellent design, world-class finish. So you'll be very happy when you come to us. Like we discussed earlier, I think one of the biggest challenges in uh, operating a business in Nigeria is lack of basic infrastructure. Um, there's a lot of land everywhere, but because you'll have to consider when you build, you'll have to provide, most times you have to provide the road yourself. You'll have to also develop some of the electric, electricity infrastructure and of course provide security for your residents. So you find out in other countries, all these things are readily available. The government provides the roads, so 
where the government is lagging behind the developers to pick up. So that makes it very challenging and you find out that the cost of construction also goes up because you have to provide, you have to provide all those things. It says we've wasted a lot of time. We failed to catch up with the world and we haven't maintained what we had in the past. So what we need to do now is to assess ourselves, to see where we are right now, to understand, to have a, great, a grand scheme, to understand what we want to build across the, uh, the country, what sort of infrastructure plan do we, do we want to have. Like we had in the past, we had Vision 2010, 2020. We, we need to come up with a proper plan and we need to follow it. And not just follow it, we need to make sure that what we do in the past remains. We need to build quality. Build roads that last for 50 to 100 years, not the ones that last for two to three years. Build buildings that will be serviced for the next 50 to 100 years as well, not the ones that will dilapidate after 20 years. Most of the schools, when you go to local governments and, uh, and states, most of the schools, hospitals that are being built are, are not really built to world-class standard. So we can improve on that. It's not just about building hospitals and schools and roads. They need to last. Because if they last, then you will not need to go back to build them all over again. I think my word, is, my, my word of advice is not just going to be to uh, young Nigerians. It will be to parents as well. Parents and kids need to understand that the world has changed. The classic thought that you will go to school, um, collect your certificates, and come and go into the industry and jobs will be waiting for you. That's, that classic thinking is, is out. You need to understand that by the time you're coming out of school, it's not what you are holding, not the certificate you're holding, it's what you're capable of. What can you provide? What service can you provide in the industry? Any industry you want to work in. And uh, the future is not about what you have learned in school. It's what you do. So students and parents need to focus more on acquiring skills. There are so many people that uh, in the future you will not study construction. You will, if you study construction, you don't have to be in the construction industry. You can end up in IT once you understand the training. You can study IT I end up in a hospital, doing um, hospital IT, IT, IT infrastructure. So the future is very dynamic when it comes to employment. So, so parents and parents need to understand that they don't need to force their kids to focus on reading and reading and schooling and schooling, but also training and training and acquiring skills. That's going to be very key in the future. So, um, of course, my name is uh, Isiaku Gambodori. I'm from Borno State. Uh, I graduated from uh, ATBU, Aboka Tafawaleo University, building department. and. Uh, I also have a master's in uh, engineering project management. Um, I'm one of uh, eight kids. Um, I'm also married, happily married, with a son. So, um, I've been in the construction industry for just slightly over 10 years. Uh, practiced um, on several projects across uh, in Nigeria. I've built several roads, bridges, uh, more than 500 houses in Abuja as well with other companies before starting my own company. So when I came out of school, of course, I found the best players and I went to learn how to work from them. So when I was done with my training and I understood the industry, it was time to set up my own. So I set up my own company and then we started operating in uh, properly in 2015. So here we are today. So I want to say a very big thank you, sir, for making our time to be with us out of your busy schedule. We really appreciate your time on the program. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hello viewers. It's glad to know you're watching your program. I am Paul Kingsley. Now, in continuation of the ongoing report we are doing on infrastructure development in Nigeria today. Today we are taking the topical look at the various issues affecting infrastructure development. And one important area we are going to be focusing on is the facility management sector. And with us on the program is the Managing Director, CEO of Greenbox Facilities. is to give us his own take on the various issues, you know, the contributions of facility managers to our development, to our infrastructure development. I'm talking of Mr. Dele Abiru. 
he's going to be giving us his own take, you know, their contributions to facility management, how it has impacted to our infrastructure developments. Sit back, relax, it promises to be an exciting one. I'll be back after this time out. Thank you. Facilities um, is a total hygiene and facility management group that offers a wide range of services as regards building maintenance, um, integrated pest control management, cleaning services, and you know everything that has to do with building maintenance basically. Um, Greenbox has been in existence close to half a decade now and uh, what actually inspired the innovation was the, the need, the lack of um, facility management in our climb here. Not just in Nigeria but Africa as a whole. So that was what actually spurred us on to bring this on board, to fill in the gap that we've noticed in our country and the continent in general. Uh, well, talking about um, the projects we've embarked on, within the short period, I'll call it short period because, uh, I, mean, uh, I mean, about a decade, it's just about four or five years. So within a short period, we've been able to cover the niche for ourselves with the number of clientele that we have amongst which uh, we have FIRS, that's Federal um, Inland Revenue Service. We have First Bank, we have Sky Bank, and uh, some other few organizations, you know, like NSITF and private individuals. And the way we feel that we've impacted, you know, is basically um, some people know the value of our services and they, they go all out to make sure they get the best and not minding what it's going to cost them you know so it is obvious to us that the need is there you know but um, if it's all Nigerian that needs the service or that wants it it's still yet to be um, a certain um, honestly sometimes it's very disappointing and in some cases it's quite encouraging some people don't see the need for some of the services that we render and some feel that it's just a regular service that just anybody the house boys or the you know just anybody can just be called upon to take care of it especially when you guys the cleaning aspect of it and even the pest control there are a lot of quacks out there you know any builder assumes he is a cleaner you know so it's sometimes it's quite frustrating sometimes it's um, disappointing and challenging but not to say that, you know, there isn't the good part of it because, like I said earlier, some people just want the best. Maybe based on their exposure or maybe based on the knowledge that they have, you know. So that has just been um, the, yeah. Well, as it goes that um, our professionalism stands out for us, you know, we just don't uh, render service. We follow up. And we make sure that our clients, at the end of every service that we render, they're happy with us. You know, and uh, we put standards in place. Not just local standards, even international standards. Well, um, yes, a lot of people do not appreciate the service that we render. And um, of course, and it's obvious, you know, if we go around public buildings, you know, even private buildings, you'll be surprised. I haven't invested so much money in putting structures in place to manage and maintain the facility. It's a huge problem. 
you know. But I haven't said that. Um, what I would look forward to, you know, and I know that the points, sometimes the large legislative year, you know, there was a legislation that um, the association has been trying to push forward, you know, to make sure that in every building, you know, from the state of the um, conceptualizing the idea, the need to put in place a facility manager from the, you know, on, from the onset of each of the properties. If you go to Federal Secretariat, the structure was built by foreigners. You know, most times when you go there now, the, the facilities are not functioning. You even observe that some of the central cooling system put in place there because the, the Germans that built the place, they've come back to their country. They have to now source for other form of um, um, air condition to put in place there, abandoning what was there. So the need is staying in our faces. If the legislation can be strengthened or if it can be put in place for this purpose, I'm sure it's going to help us. Well, facility management generally, it's a multidiscipline um, industry. You know, right here in Greenbox, we have people from all um, and business endeavors, you know, cut across engineers, the, um, you know, builders, civil engineers, you know, I mean, name it. So it's a huge business, ordinarily. But for what it takes now, you know, you just mentioned the issue of uh, railways, all those are facilities that needs to be maintained. And the earlier we take it seriously in this country, the better for all of us. Because we can't invest so much money on all of these businesses or buildings or, you know, or infrastructure, and you don't. I mean, I, I just let it just dilapidate, just like that. There is no law that makes it mandatory for um, builders to engage facility management. You understand? Because we try, you know, f I mean, the uh, business development unit of this organization go out every day trying to buy, get people to buy into the idea of having um, a professional facility manager to manage facilities. Some people are keen into it, some they are finding it difficult, and you know what the government uh, policies are. Once there is no pro uh, budgetary provision for it, nothing can be done. So I mean, it's quite discouraging, but I believe that if the laws can be strengthened or put in place, you know, to make it mandatory for business developers and property owners to engage credible and tested facility managers, then I'm sure we will uh, we'll have somewhere to go. And it's not just about the industry, you know, the kind of people that we bring in on board. Like Greenbox now, I just told you, we are going to be five years. And um, the number of employees we have, you know, that we pay directly. I mean, we're taking a lot of people away from the streets, you know, helping the government. So, I mean, basically, Well, um, in as much that um, they sound alike um, and uh, you can't separate maintenance from facility management. But the difference is that, you know, facility, as a facility manager, a professional one for that matter, um, there are a lot of preventive steps you take before maintenance. Although, though, you know, like I said, you can't really separate both together, but there are processes for a, a professional facility manager and just maintenance. There are some routine checks you carry out on buildings that before it gets to the state that you manage, you need to even you have to, have to change. You know, there are certain things you could do to tweak it or prevent it from happening. But of course, there are stages that you have to still maintain in facility management. So to answer your question, they sound the same, but um, in our own profession, they're slightly different. Well, if um, we can come together as the different practitioners, because another thing that we observe, even builders these days, they jostle for our job. Because they build properties, they want to assume the role of facility manager, which ordinarily I think they're different. Apart from that, estate agents, you know, they want to take up the role of a facility manager. If we can come together as, as a body, to strengthen our association and at the same time, you know, try and uh, be out there more 
And like I said, because I'll keep emphasizing on the need for proper legislation. Because without that, we might not be able to push anything. But if we are backed by the law, then of course it will be left for the implementation of, of it, which I think uh, we should be able to achieve. Okay. I will say no. You know, and um, the reason being that um, even for the different practitioners of this um, field coming together, there is no pulling point. You know, we need to come together. You know, there is strength in coming together. You know, you came here, okay, just like we uh, in December, we had a novelty match. Well, I'm hoping, like you said, in 2018, what's going to happen? We're hoping that in this new year now, we would get to go out more out there, you know, try and who some of our other colleagues to to let them see the need for us to network and do things jointly. If we can come together, I'm sure that um, we can get the the national assembly to do the needful. Enormous and good enough that you know um, when we're starting up. Um, you know, I was able to put some funds together, you know, directly and through friends and family. I didn't go into bank. If I'd gone into bank to raise money to start up this, this, this business, I'm sure I'll be out of business by now. Because, you know, every business has its own teething problems. You know, at a point, I, I almost gave up because we came with a bank and with a standard that, look, we just need people to see us in a different... You can see the branding that we have. You know, so um, funding is a very huge problem. There are some equipments that ordinarily we should have, but because of this same factor, and you can approach the banks. If you approach them, I mean, we've approached them several times, and um, we have to just come back. It's very frustrating. You know, those are areas we feel the government too can help. I mean, they're talking about enabling environment. Another problem that we have: multiple taxation. You know, the AEPB will come with theirs. The Abuja Municipal will come, you have to do tax, you have to do PENCOM, you have to do NSITF, I mean, just name it. So, and if, you know, you're going to start up a business of such, and you're looking at your cost of uh, doing your documentation being over a million naira, I wonder how much you can have to start up. And, you know, some of the materials and equipment that we use, we have to even import them. So, looking at what the rate, the naira rate is to, I mean, so... Right. That's the funny one because I'm sure even on your way here you pass through some uh, public buildings. I mean, and the clear one is National Secretariat, whichever wing you choose to go. You know, I mean, it's just same of same, and we need to just change this attitude. We need to just do it. Maybe in their books they could have said they carry out maintenance, you know, but look, internal maintenance will not help any organization your best to outsource it. You know, face, face your core business, let other people, professionals, handle the issue of facility management. Number one, you're going to save cost, you know, it's going to be more effective and efficient. So, I mean, what more do you, do you need in terms of, the, you know, so there is so much need. It's staying on our faces. Go to National Stadium. National Stadium should be managed by Green Box, we're crying out loud. You know, and I'm sure that there will be a big turnaround there. So I mean, those are it's, and it's not just buildings. Like you know, even the I mean, properties. You know, I mean, name it. You mentioned railway service. You know, they're putting so much money on it without proper maintenance of the facility. We're going to go back to where we were. So why the huge budgetary allocations on such you know buildings? Well, green box facility, whether we, either with government or without government, green box will be an household name, not just in Abuja where we operate, Nigeria and um, Africa, you know, to say the least. That's five years, you said? Yeah. Yes. So let me just leave it there. When you're asking for 10 years, then I'll tell you where we should be. Well, um, I'm equally a young Nigerian anyway, like you said, but. Um, being into business, you know, I've seen few people come up to me to ask me, you know, these same questions. 
But in as much as I know, I mean, all the challenges that are associated with starting up business in Nigeria, I keep on encouraging them. Yes, you can do it. You know, I mean, for us to be able to do it, sometimes it's very frustrating. You might think that, look, I'm going to drop this because I left a paying job to start this up. And it took me two years to put this together. So you can imagine from a regular paying job, I sit back at home thinking of what, you know, what next move to make from waking up very in the morning, going out and coming back. For over about two years, I was just putting the whole ideas together and trying to raise funds to do it. So for me to be able to get it this much, I'm sure, I mean, the younger ones can even do even better, you know, but, you know, don't wait for government. If government comes, it's going to help. Like, if we get support from government now, I mean, our staff strength would, would go AY. Right now, we are, I mean, close to 100 within the space of four years. So, I mean, you can imagine what will happen in another two, three years. And we're gradually getting stability. So let me encourage the young ones to please follow suit. Don't just leave school and um, you're waiting for jobs. Yes, you know, things have gone wrong in schools these days. The technical know-how is not there. So even the graduates that leave school, the only thing they think of is to just get employed. For them to think out of the box, you know, that what can I do to create, you know. You don't have me to even have 100 start, uh, workforce. Just two or three, you can start something. You know, so I mean, I just encourage them to continue to push and I can assure that uh, they will look back and be happy with themselves. Um, Dela Biru, um, I'm from Lagos State in Ikorodu and I'm an alumni of uh, Lagos State University and I've, I've attended um, different uh, training programs both locally and internationally on facility management and um, I used to be in National Assembly. I was um, uh, essay to the most vocal honorable member, Honorable Abike Dabiri, during her days in National Assembly. And um, I'm a strong Nigerian. I say strong because, you know, doing business in Nigeria, you just have to be strong. And, you know, and um, basically that is the, I mean, the much about my humble self. Yeah. Well, this is very time. time. We told Sumos a very big thank you, sir, for making our time to be with us, you know, out of your busy schedule and your contribution and support. We thank you so much. Thank you very much, Kinsley. Thank you. My pleasure. Much. Yeah.